Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome to any visitors with us. We're grateful to have you here worshiping our God together. What a blessing those baptisms were uh, to my heart. As a church, if you'll turn to the epistle of the uh, Romans that Paul wrote, just so rich, we've been studying it for a couple years. Uh, we're going to pull out of Romans. I don't know what I'm thinking. My brain uh, is not doing good with, with everything this morning. So um, we're going to actually go to Matthew chapter 11. It's similar to Romans. <laughs> it's about Jesus, <clears throat> my favorite subject. And I want to help you make some application of what we've been learning on divine election in Romans chapter 9, just showing God's initiative and drawing us to himself. Every time you hear a testimony, you hear about how God brought someone to faith in him and him alone. And so Matthew 11, we're going to study there this morning, and we're going to look at this subject of soul rest. Let me just read in verse 28. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, for you will find rest for your souls. And so this morning, we're going to talk about soul rest. We live in a country that's designed to make the body and soul restless, the land of opportunity. You come to have the American dream, and it's just filled with pressure to accomplish, be successful, climb the corporate ladder so you can accomplish anything you want, enter into this country, the land of franticness. So it's a land filled with drive and competition. It's a, a land filled with comparison that drives us on a daily basis. The influential succeed and power hungry people through, through our minds to, to get power and through our jobs to show our identity and through body beautiful to, to gain the power that comes with that through education, being movers and shakers. A million dreams is what it's going to take. Social media, a whole new pressure to have the perfect family, the perfect life, perfect image, perfect vacations, to work even harder now to have a social media presence as well. There's no break from it. There's not a Sabbath from it. Because when we rest, we feel this lack of rest in our minds and in our hearts when we're quiet. And so we're a land with a million inventions to mask this lack of rest. And it can be through drugs. It can be through sleep aids, Netflix, entertainment. In our text this morning, I want you to hear this, it's religion. We can use religion to try to calm the soul rest and actually will uh, increase restlessness. They're trying to be approved by being a good person or the best version of you. And all the efforts and money and time put into fixing our problem, the best word I can come up with is restlessness is what I see all around us. The land of the free who are enslaved to sin and restless. Do you feel it in your soul this morning with all the waves churning and all of the restlessness? We're going to look at something absolutely beautiful. In our text, Jesus will identify the problem, and he's going to give the only cure for the restless soul. And there's a soul rest for the people of God that Sean read about, a city of refuge with peace. Jesus offers that to you this morning. I want you to verse 27 of Matthew 11. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him, to, to show him the gospel, to show the Father, to show Christ. And so we pray and we are going to ask the Lord of heaven and earth to give us the soul rest, to reveal God to us in a way that we could have Shabbat, Sabbath rest for the people of God. This is what Jesus came to give, shalom with God. I think of Jesus on the boat with his disciples, and there's this great storm, and, and he's sleeping, and the disciples are scared. They're waking him, saying, don't you care? Don't you care? And he goes, shh, and the waves just stop just like that. And I've just been praying for you that that would happen to your soul this morning with all of the waves, shh, and that the waves of your soul would just stop. Because we have all these waves of COVID, political uprisings and wars and rumors of wars and economic collapse raging all about us. 
And in the middle of all that's going on, we can have a soul rest. It's been so sweet to me the last couple of years. It's just been deepening with all these waves, this deep soul rest that I have found in Christ. Jesus said, my peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. And that's my prayer for every soul this morning in this place. If you're live streaming wherever you are, I just pray for soul rest this morning. So let's go to the Prince of Peace. Let's go to our Father and ask for that this morning. Father, we come with confidence to the throne of grace because of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we do live in the land of unrest. Lord, it is so, so many waves of different things hitting against us on a daily basis. And these words of Christ are water to a man in a desert. God, I pray this morning, let soul rest come upon every soul in this place. God, let us drink this up in such a beautiful way. Meet us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew 11. I just want to set a little context. Jesus has been born into this world by a virgin. His miracles, he's been going around doing miracles that are showing that he's God. He's preaching the gospel, Matthew 5 through 7, and one of the greatest sermons ever preached in the history of the world, the Sermon on the Mount. He sent out the 12 and the 70 to preach. The people of Galilee are hearing the gospel, and the majority of them are rejecting the gospel as Jesus is preaching it. And they thought that Jesus was going to come and give a political rest from their enemies, from Rome. And, 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 and he comes and says, I'm going to give you a soul rest. And they're struggling with this. And in our chapter this morning, even John the Baptist now is struggling. He, in verse 6 of, of Matthew 11, Jesus says, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. And so John in verse uh, 5, Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John the Baptist what you hear and see the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Here he comes. He's going to the poor. He's, he's healing. He's humble. He's gentle. And they're, they're stumbling over him. And Jesus says, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. And the rest of the chapter is now going to deal with this unbelief and battling with who Christ is. Christ will take this time to address unbelief. And at the core of unbelief, I want you to hear this. It's not so much that I don't have enough evidence. If I just had more evidence, I would believe. But it's a state of the heart that will not believe. It just takes truth and suppresses it. And at our very essence, we want to be God. We want to dictate life, say how it should run, stay in control of our own lives. I just want to be in control. My thoughts, my view of the world. My way that God should run it, my mind, my reasoning. I just want to stay in control. And this is a call Jesus says take on my yoke, surrender to me, and give me full control and authority in your life. Surrender all. It feels scary, it feels out of control. And Jesus says it's the only way you're ever going to get soul rest. It's what you're really looking for, and you can't find by staying in control. So as you're trying to stay in control, your soul's restless. It's not working because it, you know what? I hate to ruin your day. It's a facade that you're in control. You're not, and your whole life will testify to it. How is, how is it going to be to be in control? So no matter what Jesus says or does, you won't believe. You won't believe, and he shows it. If you pull the verses up in verses 20 through 24 of Matthew 11, is it working? Oh, look at that. <clears throat> then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they didn't repent. So they're watching the miracles of God and they won't repent. And he says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. If they saw these miracles, they would have repented. Nevertheless, I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which Sodom and Gomorrah, you know that story, which occurred in you, it, it would have remained to this day. They would have repented. 
Nevertheless, I say to you that it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And so you've heard the gospel, you've heard the truth, you've seen God himself doing miracles, and you will not believe. And it's going to be uh, harder for you in the day of judgment than those that never saw this. So unbelief is not just a lack of evidence. There's something in your heart that resists and rejects Jesus and his message. And all the miracles watching God himself cannot overcome it. And Jesus proves it further. Go to Matthew 11, verse 16. What should I compare this generation to? I love his illustration. It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children and say, hey, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. You're, you're, you're like <coughs> little children playing a game and they're sitting there going, I don't want to play. Well, let's play wedding. I don't like wedding. Well, let's play funeral. I don't like funeral. And everything you just keep saying, let's play this. I don't want to. He says, that's what you're like. That's what you're like. He says, for John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking and they go, he's got a demon. He's telling us to repent, and he's not enjoying the things of the world. He's just demonic. Well, then the Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I don't want to play. I don't like it. I don't like the way John says it. I don't like the way Jesus says it. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. I, I just won't repent, no matter how it comes no matter how it's preached, no matter what I see, my heart just wants to be God. Look with me in verses 25 through 27. So at this time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, the smart, the brilliant, and you've revealed them to babes. You've revealed them to, to infants and the humble ones. Yes, Father, for this way it was well-pleasing in your sight. God likes this, and he gets glory from it. Instead of you coming in through all your power, all your mind, all your understanding, he reveals it to those who come as little children, and God's pleased with this. And all things have been handed over to me by, by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And listen to this. And to anyone to whom the Son wills or desires to reveal him. Free sovereign grace, again, what we've been studying in Romans 9, is that God chooses whom he'll reveal Christ to. It's free, free sovereign grace. How do I know then if Jesus is revealing it to me? It's not to get out the book of life and to turn the pages and say, let's say M, is Murphy in there? Is Ken in there? That is not how you get it. But guys, I want you to hear this morning something even better. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they listen. And this morning, he's going to say, come to me. Come to me, right after verse 27. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Those whom he reveals himself to will come to him. And they will say, I'm weary and heavy laden. And, and they will take his yoke most gladly upon them. To have Christ as your king and ruler is water to a man in the desert. If he does not reveal himself, you will stay committed to unbelief. You will stay in restlessness in this merry-go-round of trying to find peace and rest in this world with every other thing but God. And you'll just keep chasing it going, wait, that didn't, that didn't solve it. That didn't solve it. And you'll just keep trying to find how to get rest and you won't find it. I pray this morning that you would hear the voice of Christ from his word. And so let's look at, I think, the most beautiful verse in the Bible. Matthew eleven, twenty-eight. 28. We're going to look at four ways to outline this, four understandings to find your soul rest. First, I want to look at who are the people that find it. Jesus' plea, his promise to those who come, and the, the product, the fruit that comes out of coming to Christ. So look with me in verse 28, the plea, the plea. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who are the persons? These people are those who are weary. The last two years have truly increased this problem 
for us. We're weary. I, I think as a pastor, I've never seen people more weary since I've been alive. And that's why caffeine's going up, monster drinks, fizzy sticks, everything that can give me energy. We're just a weary people. And what I'm seeing is you're weary with life. America, the promise of the American dream, it's falling apart, democracy's crashing. We're weary with life because a lot of foundations are being taken out from under us. And we're just sitting here going, I don't get all this, I'm weary. What a great word for this day and age. Just look out there, weary. How you doing? I'm weary. That's all I hear. The word means to labor to exhaustion. You're, you're laboring to the point of fatigue. This is weary. It's a present tense verb, continual sense of weariness. I can't find rest. There's no rest in this world. Everywhere I look, uh, uh, the news just makes me more anxious. It doesn't give me rest. Well, what are you so weary about? Why, why are these people weary? Well, our context is the, the Pharisees and religion and moralism. And so what they're weary with, they're trying to keep the law to do enough to get God to accept them, to have peace. And they are so committed to it, to live right and be a good person, that they're exhausted. They're weary trying to be good enough to get God to smile upon them. You're looking to your own resources and you just keep trying to get God to be pleased with you. You're exhausted from trying to earn salvation. You're tired from trying to measure up, to keep a list, to be approved by God, to be the best version of you, to love your neighbor as yourself. My neighbors are gnarly now. They're getting worse. <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself. I can't even live up to my own standard. I put my head on my pillow, and I just hear this sermon, you're coming short, you're coming short. If I were to die tonight, I have no peace. And that's what's making me weary. I don't have peace with God, and I'm trying to be better and better, and I can't get peace that I could die this very night and be okay with God. Martin Luther, that great saint, was hit by lightning, and he devoted himself to serving God and being pleasing to him. And he eventually went to a monastery where he was just seeking to please God. And he's going to confession. I can't remember how many times a day, but it's all day long. What do you do in a monastery? And he's tormented as he's trying to keep the law, the righteousness that God requires. He's just laboring at it. And, and Luther's just dying under this fatigue of trying to get right with God by the law. And, and finally someone says, Luther, what do you want? He said, I just want a God who loves me and I can love. <laughs> That's the weariness. No matter how hard I try, God doesn't love me and I can't love him because he's got this standard I can't measure up to. That's what this is about. That's what he's calling to this morning. Are you weary? Some of you are sitting here this morning doing the same thing with Protestant religion. Every sermon or book that you read it's a new list of what you have to do for God. And you're just sitting here weary because you just get this list, this list. Parents got to do this. Mom's got to do that. I got to do. You just keep getting your list and you're getting wearier and wearier and wearier. My soul is not at rest. And the more I hear about rest... It makes me restless because I'm not resting and I got to work harder at resting. You laugh. I hear that on a daily basis. You're making me anxious by telling me to rest. Religion always produces the same thing. Weariness. And that's what it produces every time. It will always make you weary. And secondly, heavy laden. This is a, a, a perfect passive participle, which means it, it's been put upon you um, and, and it's continual. So some, sometime in the past, a great load was put upon you, an external burden, and it's the burden of legalism, to keep this law so that God can accept you, so that he could like you and be happy with you. Here's your list, your rules, the church guidelines if you want to be a godly man or woman. And, and Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
and, and you got some load that's put upon you. At the time of writing, rabbinical teaching had become so massive and demanding, it was all-encompassing, that it prescribed standards and formulas for every human activity. And no one could keep them. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 4. They tie up heavy loads and lay them on men's shoulders, burdens. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. And so they teach you and they lay these burdens of what you need to do. And they're, they're hypocrites and they don't even try to do them themselves. The call this morning is for those who are weary and heavy laden. Christ has a message for you. That's not the way to find rest. It leaves you weary and tired. I was thinking about this during the week. And some of you say, man, I don't even think about the law. I don't even know if I believe in God. And yet you're weary and heavy laden. Why? Because everyone's been made in God's image. And we have the inter internal law written within our constitution. And we all know that we should love our neighbor. And we're all trying to prove ourselves and show that we really are somebody. We're trying to work to, to be justified, to prove our existence and why we should be here. We do it through jobs and through relationships, possessions, body, appearance, popularity, being the best parent, comparison. We all know it. We all know what it is, and we're trying to do it, and we're weary and heavy laden. I overcommit because I'm trying to prove myself. I overwork to show that I'm really somebody in my field. I study so hard to prove my existence. I don't show my wife any weaknesses and fears because I'm the man. My appearance, day and night, I'm focused on it. I'm so together. I just got my, everything is always right. I can't wait for my 10-year reunion from high school to show everybody I'm something now. No matter how much progress we make, we know by creation the beauty of God and we're undone no matter how hard we try at it. We see his perfections and we come short and we're weary and we're all trying to prove ourselves and justify who we are, that we really matter. We're not what we were told growing up in our lives and we're all living under this burden of trying to prove ourselves. And in our text, Jesus calls it a yoke. He says, take up, you know, so if you take on his yoke, you know what that means? That you had a yoke of your own before it. And so what is a yoke? Is it that little yellow part of an egg? That's bad. It was a beam with two metal rings, and you'd put the horse or the mule or the ox under it, and you would be yoked to it, and it, it would pull the cart. So if you're ground tilling up the ground, whatever it is, you, you'd be yoked in it. And so to take Jesus' yoke shows that you're yoked to something else. And something that you're yoked to is you're trying to find your purpose, your meaning, your reason for living. It's your North Star, whatever it is that your life is about, that it's going to finally make you be somebody and prove your worth. You're living for it. It's controlling you. It drives everything. You're yoked to it. And for some of you, it's your spouse. I just want his approval or her approval. It's kids. I, I got to raise my kids right. And I got I to do it. And it just sits and you're yoked to it. It dominates you and it's your identity and who you are. It's your career. It's your house, your 401k, your ministry. It could be ministry. It's making you really weary and really heavy laden. For me, it was God's approval. I was consumed with trying to get God's approval and it was killing me. And then it became trying to get the world's approval earlier. It makes your soul restless and it makes you weary and heavy laden. And I didn't come in here to make you miserable. I want to look at the next point then. That's the problem. That's the people. That's us. Now I want to give you this plea from God himself. I think my favorite words in the Bible. All who are weary and heavy laden and, and the call is, come to me. Come to me. This is Jesus Christ bidding you to come. God sent a person, not an argument, into the world to save. The beauty of Christianity that it's, it's not a religion. It's not coming to a moral ethic. 
It's not coming to a a system to get God's acceptance. It's not coming to a creed or a confession. We needed a savior from our sin. And God himself says, come to me. I could meditate on those words the rest of my life. It's the whole Bible in a word. Come to me and I will give you rest for your soul. Want to know what Christianity is all about? There it is. Come to Christ and I'll give you salvation. I will give you the soul rest that you've been looking for in all the wrong places and all the wrong faces. Come. I'll give you that rest. God himself, the whole Old Testament, he's unapproachable, stay out. He's too holy. And now the holy God is standing in their midst and says, come to me. Come to me. Yeah, and be consumed. No, and find rest for your soul. Stay out or you'll be consumed. And God himself saying, come to me and I'll give you rest for your soul. I won't consume you. I will will draw you in and love you and accept you and save you and give that soul rest that you've been looking for your whole life. How? How? I have to perform. I got I to gotta earn your presence, oh God. I have to atone for my sin and my wrongdoings. How? I, I need an answer for guilt, my shame, my sin, my separation from God. I got to prove myself. I'm unworthy, my restlessness. I got this deep desire for home, for God. And Jesus says, I've come to bring you back to God. I've come to go under the sword of justice by the Father for your sins. Jesus will be pierced through for your sins. He says, I've come to be that atonement. I've come to keep the law's demands. To be in God's presence, you got to be perfect. And Jesus came and he gave perfection. He obeyed that law perfectly. I've come to bring a full salvation by my doing, says Jesus. And I'll give it to the one who will quit doing. I'll give it to you as a gift, but you got to quit doing. You got to come with nothing. Quit trying to self justify, weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest for your souls. Lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in Him alone and gloriously complete. Lay it down. We sang it this morning, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. These for sin could not atone, thou must save and thou alone. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Oh, come to me. Come to me. Jesus said it's finished. I've done everything necessary. Come to me and I'll give you rest for your souls. Come to me is the joy of my life. That's the gospel. Come to Christ and find salvation. Come and I'll give you rest for your soul, your weary soul. Whether you're a prostitute or you've been in the church your whole life, if you're still holding to what you can do to be right with God, I want you to hear Jesus Christ say, come. Come to me without money, without cost, without merit, without preparation, just come. There's one prerequisite, come as a sinner. I'm the friend of sinners. I've come for the sinners. Come to me, and you'll find rest for your soul. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come to me. The promise, 3A. What will he do for the one who comes? I will give you rest. Verse 29, you'll find rest for your souls. I'll give you rest. Shh. Give is a gift, it's not earned, it's free sovereign grace. I'll give you rest for your soul. What, what kind of rest? Well, Tetelestai, it's finished. I did everything necessary to bring you back into a relationship with God. By his doing, I want you to hear this, I'm loved by God, I'm forgiven, I'm accepted now by God, and I'm adopted, I'm justified. I'm right with God I am his and he is mine. God is for us. No condemnation. Nothing can separate us from his love. He loves me and accepts me. No more performing, doing, or striving to get his acceptance to measure up. With all this unrest around me, I am at rest. 
because of Jesus Christ. If, if you sleep during the night and you never enter into REM sleep, what happens? You wake up weary. <laughs> you don't get real rest. And this is spiritual REM. Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you that rest that you've been longing and looking for in every other place in him. I have a soul rest. Whenever I feel unrest, I come to him and I keep coming to him for soul rest. I fight the fight of faith to rest in him and him alone, to lay my deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. The message for America and the message for the American church, come to me and I will give you rest for your souls. And then let's look at our last point, the product. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. And that amazing statement, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, be saved, take my yoke upon you. Again, our, our context here is the law. The Pharisees' teaching, they've been yoked to it to try to fulfill its demands. Come to me and be yoked to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn how to, how to, how to manifest God. It says that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus has taught us how to live as a perfect son, to please the Father. Come learn from me how to live obedient and be pleasing to God. Be my disciple. The gospel has come. Come freely. Come with nothing and receive everything. Take on Jesus' yoke now and be a follower of Jesus Christ. I follow you. Teach me. Let me learn from you. Show me in the scriptures how to live for you. And the day that this was written, you, you used to be yoked to your, your teacher. And you would go live with them and you would live in their homes and they would instruct you and be around you. They dominated your life and you would learn from them. And Jesus says, come be yoked to me. This is why there's unbelief in this chapter. The reason behind unbelief is very simple. I want to call the shots. I don't want you to rule my life. And the passage is now saying you get soul rest but you must be ruled by Christ. You surrender all to him. I have to have a master. And that should bring unrest to me. And Jesus says, wait, this is the answer to unrest. Here's the answer to being weary and heavy laden. Your old yoke was killing you. When you're in control and doing your own thing, it's killing you. And you sit there dying going, I love my yoke. I don't want to give it up. I'm so free. Free to die and be weary and heavy laden. No peace. Is that what's making you weary and heavy laden? You being God, trying to fix yourself or prove yourself, makes you a slave. And the cure is coming to Jesus and being made right with God, justified. And then to be ruled by the King of Kings. To be mastered is what we fight against daily. America was built on fighting that. We're taught to question authority. Anything but self-autonomy is seen as bad in what will steal true rest. And this just flips everything on its head. Because we see what rulers do with power. We're watching it right now in Russia. It destroys, and it's been the history of the world, is power, and it's just dangerous with authority. That's why we run from it. We hate it. We push it away. But what I want you to hear this morning, who is Jesus? He's the sovereign God and creator and sustainer of the whole universe. And this one says, I'm gentle and humble in heart. Come to me. I'm not going to abuse you and manipulate you and whip you with cords. I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. Come to this one. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Your other masters are so cruel. They leave you weary and heavy laden and you can never please them enough. This master forgives every sin that you've ever committed 
And He will forgive you when you sin again and confess to Him. He's fulfilled all the law's demands, so as you come, there's nothing more i got to fulfill to be accepted. He loves you infinitely in eternity past to eternity future. He's happy with you. He's not a cruel slave master. He's humble and gentle Jesus. I don't have to work for his acceptance. I already have it. He calls me brother or sister, and he's working for my good. Take that yoke upon you. The joy of following after Jesus Christ. Best yoke I've ever had. I get to follow the, that king. I get to surrender and learn of him and follow after him. He's gentle and humble and heart. And I'm not always trying to earn his favor. I already have it. I'm, I'm following him as one who's loved and accepted by God. You rest. <laughs> my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This gospel leads people to gospel obedience. I obey now because I'm loved not to be loved. I have rest for my soul. My soul has found a resting place. So get this. You come to him, you get a yoke. You're yoked to Jesus Christ and you learn of him the rest of your days and follow him. This cost of discipleship, we follow Jesus Christ. This is a call to be a follower and walk as he walked to please the Father as he did. This is one who's serious about following Jesus. We're yoked, and we walk together, and I learn of him, and I read about him, and I commune with him, and I love him, and I follow him, and I grow in him. And I tell you this, his yoke is easy, and his burden is light, because when I come to him, he changes my heart, and I love him now, and I want to obey him. I want to follow him. I love Christianity. It's not a threat. Just fear hell and follow me. But the mercies of God offer up your body as a living sacrifice. His yoke is so beautiful. And he's gentle and he's humble. What a joy to be yoked to Christ. Obedience is not a burden. Disobedience is now my burden. There's no rest in being a sluggard. Our rest is to take Christ's yoke and be actively engaged for his service the rest of our days. The rest of heaven is not we're going to go up there and sleep the rest of our eternity. It says we're going to serve him day and night. That's our, that's our rest. Spurgeon said, holy activity in heaven is perfect rest. So working out of rest, serving out of rest. So many people are serving to get rest and it's making you weary and heavy laden. You just flip it around. You get it wrong and you'll be tired and weary. My burden is light. Get in the harness. And I won't relentlessly drive you into the ground like all your other idols. That you never can measure up and never get approved. I'll forgive you. I will cover you and I will help you. Have you taken this yoke upon you? Are you in Christ yoked together? learning of him and walking with him and obeying him, that's true rest. That's the rest that we're looking for and longing for, to walk as he did. Beautiful? My favorite, I think it's my favorite verse. Come to me. How do I get this? I'm going to close out. In verse 25, he said something interesting. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, but you revealed them to in infants. And he, he reveals to whoever he desires or wishes, and he wishes to reveal them to who? To infants. Okay? So that doesn't just mean that every baby's going to get saved here this morning. Infants, picture something. Little children enter my rest, not the wise, the self-sufficient, those who are in control. Jesus said uh, later in Matthew 18, 3, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So what do we know about children? I was reading a guy this week who drew out a couple things that I really liked about children. First, children know they're helpless, right? They know they're helpless. I got this cute little granddaughter, and I think she's the cutest thing God ever made. Beautiful. She's one. She turned one. And she always says, Grandpa. You know, she doesn't say Grandpa, but she holds her hands out. <laughs> and the minute I take her, she does, this is what happens every time. And she, she points at everything she wants. Because she's figured out that this guy will take her to anything and everything. 
<laughs> Nothing is no, don't touch. And she just wants me now. But what I'm learning is she's helpless. She can't get to anything. She can't touch anything. And she just knows I need someone to help me. And children just, they're poor in spirit. So you got to come to the place where you finally realize I can't be good enough. I can't work hard enough. I can't get my way into the kingdom. We heard that in our baptisms this morning. And you finally hold out an empty hand and come to Jesus for him and him alone to save you. The only requirement to come to him is to bring nothing. Just come in your sin and come to Christ without trying to clean up and get religious and change your life. I got to be humble and dependent and look to Christ alone for my salvation. And the other thing about children is they're very confident that you love them. Because I've watched, all five of mine did this. They, they could be awful. And they'd keep you up all night. And they'd wake up and, you know, Josh just had his little baby this week. He said he was up six hours the other night. How, how, do you, how do you handle a baby crying for six hours all night? You're getting no sleep and they just whine. Do you want this? No, no. Do you want this? No. And, and they're just awful. <laughs> and as they do it, they just smile like, I know you love me. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. I can pout, scream, do anything. And you love me. And many sit here going, I've messed up my life so bad. You could never love me. He says, come to me and rest and not trying to earn his love. Rest in his love because it's finished in Christ. I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. To be confident that in Christ, God loves me. And all my sins have been separated as far as the east is from the west, and I'm wrapped in a righteousness that Jesus has purchased. He's, he's fulfilled. He's done. And God really loves me. I'm, I'm as confident as a child. Because I, so many of you are trying to live the Christian life, and you don't believe that. And this gospel demands that God loves you in Christ Jesus. And the one who gets that, I will give you rest for your soul. And lastly, Christ went to Calvary. And on that tree, he had no rest. The father pulled out that sword of justice and he pierced his own son through to where he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God was not with them. The fellowship for all of eternity, they're separated now as he's bearing the wrath of God for sin. God's against him. He's punishing him. He's taking the punishment that we deserve for our iniquities. And Jesus is saying, I took unrest. <laughs> I had unrest like you. I was sweating drops of blood for your soul. And I went into that so that I could give you freely rest. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. The only prerequisite being weary and heavy laden with trying to get yourself right with God, and I will give you rest for your soul. I will give you that deep, deep soul rest in a world of unrest. Come. Coming is an act of faith to believe in the one who bids you that he's done everything necessary to give you rest with God. Come to Christ, and I will give you rest this morning for your soul. Let's pray. Father, what sweet words from the King of kings and Lord of lords to bid all men, women, and children to come to him for soul rest. No prerequisites, no religious duties, no cleaning up, no fulfilling laws, demands, just coming as filthy sinners who are weary and tired trying to fix it, trying to live in a life to self-justify. Oh God, there's a Savior bids us to come that we could have this rest of soul. And while all the waves are around us in this world, we are unique, we're peculiar, we're aliens because we have this rest, because we're right with God. We know that you love us. We know that you're working for our good. We know that you're handpicking which trials you'll bring into our lives. You're over them, you're sovereign, you're using them for a purpose. God, we live in peace. We, we live in the, the city of refuge. 
The, the manslayer of justice can't touch us any longer. We're free. So God, I pray, let the, let the children of God drink up their soul rest again this morning. To just be coming to him again and again as to a living stone. Lord, we have so much peace in our soul because of Christ. I am loved by God. Overwhelm every saint with that. And God, if there are any who came in here weary and heavy laden, oh, let them see Christ right now with his hands open saying, come to me. The message has not changed 2,000 years later. He still holds his hands out and begs men through preachers, come, come to me and I will give you rest for your soul. And my yoke, instead of living to earn and merit favor and get the world's approval, my rest, my yoke is easy and light. Oh God, thank you for this glorious gospel. May we learn of you and be followers of Jesus Christ with all the days that we have left. God, I thank you for such a beautiful Savior. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen.